Hey, everybody. Um, so excited to have you here. Um, hope everybody can hear us well. Um, if there's any issues, put it in the chat. But uh, I am Jason Lemkin from Saster. We're the world's largest community for cloud founders. And I think we have absolutely probably the most interesting panel or session I've ever done. I've been doing, we've been doing eight Saster annuals and I've been doing events of some form for 10 years on accident. But not only is this an all-star panel, but I think we have the perfect group for the time for July, 2022. And let me tell you, let me introduce them, but tell you why I think th these are particularly interesting uh, folks to talk about where we're really at in these weird times. So we've got Sarah Franklin here, president and CMO of Salesforce. And um, what's super interesting, Salesforce, $30 billion in ARR, growing 24% and accelerating, growing faster than before. And for everyone listening, and maybe Chris or Sarah, Varney, help me do the math, but 24% of 30 billion is adding 7 billion of net new, <laughs> net new ARR per year. So like, we just need a master class right there because that's a lot of pipeline to add. I think that's a lot of leads um, to add 7 billion. But, and what was interesting is at the end of last quarter, and, and then we'll, we'll dig in with all the panelists and we'll get a snapshot of where we're today. Mark Benioff said they weren't seeing any signs of a slowdown yet. And Salesforce is accelerating at scale. Like when, 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 I, when this group of panelists started doing SaaS, I don't think we ever believed anyone could get to a billion ARR. And we certainly didn't believe if you got to 10, you could accelerate, right? <laughs> so, so I think this, will, we're going to dig into this. It's incredible that this happened with Salesforce. With Chris next, Chris Kohler, CMO from Box. Box is in, in its own way just as interesting. Box is crossing a billion in ARR and it is accelerating, right? It is accelerating, almost growing 50% faster than it was six quarters ago. There's a bunch of reasons going multi-product, going more enterprise, but again, accelerating at a billion in ARR in these crazy times. So we're going to dig in there. Super interesting. We all know Box. We've all followed it. But Box, Box started off. Uh, as a rocket ship, it hit a, a medium or a slow growth path and then reacceleration. Fascinating in a time when the stock market's down a tiny bit, which we'll get into. Um, and then Sarah Varney is not only a pro in SaaS and cloud, but at a very interesting place today at Salesforce and then CMO of Twilio, which exploded, right? The number one cloud communication company grew, number one API company, number one BTI company, and then went to Attentive and... Um, Folks may or may not know Attentive. It's one of the most successful next generation marketing companies. Um, Four billion dollar valuation last time. B two B and B two C. If you're in the, if you're in the e commerce or Shopify ecosystem, you'll know Attentive because it's one of the two great. I don't know that and Clavio are ones you may not have heard of if you're not in that space. But if you have, you're like, oh my god, these these companies are growing like never before. And an innovator in mobile marketing and SMS before anybody else. And so Sarah not only has seen it all. But she, in some ways, may have the most pulse on how B2C and B2C customers are doing differently today, right? It's hard to tell. I don't know. So anyhow, what a per great panel in any other time. But I think, goodness gracious, when, when the market is down but SaaS is up, like this is the weirdest times, like this is who I want to learn from. So I only want to do one question where everyone goes around. But can we start with Sarah with an H? Just tell us what's the pulse today? What are you seeing in your customer base are we being impacted by the markets? Are there strong and weak sections? So what, I just want to get everyone's pulse of what they're seeing from their customers um, and pre-customers, their pipeline, their prospects. Yeah, since we're going around the horn, I'll try to keep it um, brief. No, take your time. This is a good, this is valuable. We want to know what Salesforce is seeing. We want to know how we're going to hit the $7 billion plan. <laughs> <laughs> so does, uh, so do my co-CEOs. I get that question every day. Um so what we're seeing with our customers is definitely there's anxiety, there's all the things that everybody sees between inflation, supply chain disruption, labor shortages, um, yep. war, you name it. And um, there's that anxiety. But the good thing about um, SaaS businesses is that technology is really the solution that our customers are seeing is the way that they're going to automate themselves um, to get more productivity, more efficiency. Um, and just help their businesses run better. And so it's interesting whether you're talking to CIOs, CDOs, CMOs, CROs, CEOs, they're all saying we need to invest more in technology and we need to even, it's not just about digital transformation, it's about automation and productivity and efficiency. And that's the conversation that we're seeing um, 
in the demand environment. And are you seeing, are you seeing pot? I mean, this, we can call digital transformation, whatever you call it. I mean, this became a, a, a tidal wave, right? Of the CEO's office. Like everyone wanted to put an amazing amount of their budget into digital transformation. Is that, is there, are there pieces of it that are on pause or slow down or, we're, or, there, or, or people are just observing how things are going? Well, it's why I think that um, this group, this time has never been more important to be a CMO or a CDO or a CCO because this is the area of, it's not just digital transformation. It really yeah. is, how am I doing my marketing? How am I doing my sales? How am I doing my customer service? And um, that whole um, area is just ripe for just reinventing itself and having the area of investment. So there's never been a more important time to be a CMO um, because every CEO is looking right and saying, hey, I need you to help me drive growth, but also to drive efficiency to make your, um, you, how can you be more effective in your demand gen? How can you be better at driving conversion? How can you be better at um, automating the engagement and that's yep. um, that's what we're seeing and chris what are you saying box is so interesting because it's gone it's nrr it's enterprise penetration all of it's gone up as box has become more critical enterprise app right um but it's still got a piece that's that's almost b2c and smb at the bottom right what do you what are you seeing in those different segments of the market yeah i mean i think following on sarah like everyone is looking around driving more productivity and efficiency out of every dollar that is spent in the organization and it doesn't matter if you're an SMB customer, three person architecture firm or a large enterprise, you're trying to figure out how do I create a better customer experience? How do I engage with my customers? And then quite frankly, how do I make my employees collaborate in a world that is very hybrid, right? So those trends aren't going away because there's economic conditions. I think, I think you, as a, as a brand, we have to make sure that we are mission critical and valuable to them in a downtime. Um, yeah. in it. So there's a lot of focus on, are they getting the value out of what they purchased and, and are we living up to our promise around that? So we haven't, we haven't necessarily seen a slowdown. I think um, this notion digital transformation has been talked about for many, many, many years, and it probably means something different to everyone else. But this notion of creating great customer experiences, driving efficiency in the business, creating a great employee experience as well. Um, those trends don't slow. We haven't seen a slowdown and I think they may just accelerate. Got it. And when, and box is interesting to me because there's, the 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 simpler version of box you use right the simplest version of box um it feels more competitive or more commodity than the more enterprise and fully functional workflow version right do you, do you see it are you seeing any signs that there's budget pressure or pricing pressure or at the bottom end people are being more sensitive today or are you not you're not getting that pulse in the market right right now we haven't necessarily seen at the bottom end of the market um a lot of economic pressure around that that yes. still continues to be a good growth vector for us um and then at the enterprise i think you know part of what we're trying to figure out is is there opportunities for us to be more critically valuable in an organization and you know where can we add more value so uh, we ne we haven't necessarily seen it today but again Things can change in a month from now. Um, you know, we may, we may see more pressure around this, but uh, the, like Sarah said, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, for sure, but we haven't necessarily seen um, it drop out. Well, let's, I want to hear from Sarah Varney on this, but both of you brought up an interesting question about positioning in 2022, like if you're, whether it's CDO or enterprise. So if you have any, let's come back to that in the next point, but if you have some thoughts about how your positioning is changing this year that, that are more in depth, I think that's interesting. But, but Sarah V, um, Generally, what are you seeing and what's, tell me what's going on. If you have intelligence on one side of your business, why are fate, why is Facebook so nervous and Google? Why are these guys almost, why is Facebook doing hiring freezes? I mean, I think these are good businesses. Why is Google slowing down? Like maybe you even have a better pulse than the rest, like, but, but talk about both sides, but why are people freaking out in B2C today? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's just been a perfect storm for the average B2C marketer over the last three years. You've got a global yeah. pandemic. Uh, you've got, uh, you know, this inflationary environment that we're living in. And then you have all this regulation, especially around traditional ad channels that are becoming much more. Well, that's for sure. Right. And so, you know, we've seen all three of those things come together in our business in particular. As you mentioned at the top of the call, we sell to uh, B2C retailers uh, quite often. We have uh, a large overlap with the Shopify customer base. And I think um, as, uh, you know, what's interesting as we've come out of COVID, there were a lot of people that at the low end of the market that started up these kind of hobbyist businesses, you know, the bracelet shop on Instagram, 
uh, and decided, you know, they were going to leave their full time career to, to take on, you know, a passion project in, in retail in this case. And, you know, as people have come out of COVID and realized for whatever reason that that's not maybe their lifetime calling, um, you know, that we've seen, we have seen some softness in that, in that low end of the market. And so, uh, but I think also, even in that, um, you know, across uh, the full spectrum of customers, we sell from everyone from the mom and pop shops to, you know, Michael's craft stores or Forever 21. Um, and I think everyone is really trying to do more with less. And with all the regulation around uh, uh, GDPR and, you know, in our space in particular, in IDFA, with all the changes that, that Apple's making in terms of what actually um, gets to your inbox, people are really trying to find new channels uh, to engage customers at that same level of efficiency. And so we're really trying to, uh, we have a, I'd say, you know, switching over to what our, our strategy, how it's changed over that time period. We're really trying to sit down with our customers and be very consultative on how they can navigate through all this new regulation and still engage their customers in a way that's compliant uh, and, you know, not going to get that, not, uh, not lead them to you know see any drop off in in uh, conversion. Yeah, let me just one one thing that I'd be curious your perspective on, um, and then open up to a larger group. But it seems on the B two C side, there's let's talk about e commerce in particular. It's because this is like where everything's so confused in 2022. On the one hand, we can say, oh my god, Shopify grew 100 percent at peak COVID, and then everyone that ha was forced to sell online, a lot of them dropped their stores, a lot of them dropped things. And, it, and on the one hand, Shopify plummeted. On the other hand, it's still growing 20% and e-commerce is still growing. So at Attentive, do you think like, are we down or are we up? Um, because we're down from peak COVID, but the trend, we're, but, but the whole area of e-commerce, and that it's, you know, it's a big part of Salesforce too and, and piece of buck, that's still, there's still tailwinds there that, that are ongoing. It's just, we're back to the historical norm. So does that, do you guys worry about that? Do you adjust your plans down or is it still a positive? How do you balance out the, which slope to look at? No, I mean, I, I think, if, you know, it's, it's hard to talk about silver linings in the context of a global pandemic, but I definitely yes. think that there are for retail. And, you know, um, for us, we had a, a, a COVID was a great forcing function for a lot of our kind of brick and mortar stores to really think about what their digital experience is going to be. And now that we're coming back into stores, we're trying to think about, all right, how about all that great digital work that you, you built through COVID? How can you make sure that you're bridging that gap back to your physical stores and creating, you know, a, a very seamless customer journey where you're um, getting a, a, every uh, piece of information that you can, whether they're, you know, on Instagram, in your store at a point of sale, um, you know, shopping on your website, uh, making sure that you're really connecting those dots. And I know um, both Chris and Sarah, uh, I, you know, that is something that that both Box and Stripe and uh, and uh, Salesforce really strive to do too, is is making sure that you've got that kind of seamless connected journey. Well, and Jason, I think there, like you even described it, there's a lot of like mixed signals in the market where everyone's exactly. as leaders were trying to figure out, are we going to, what's going to happen? And, you know, you ask about why Meta is slowing down or Google. Uh, I mean, one of the things is the FX headwind challenge that, you know, I think many of us are dealing with. I mean, for the first time, the euro and the dollar are equal, right? And that is the first time in the 20 years, I think it's been in and, and the Japanese yen. And so those all become sort of cost and revenue headwinds as we think about it. So I think there's a lot of leaders that are just being precautionary around this saying, okay, maybe maybe we need to be smart, slow this down, see how it plays out over the next few quarters. I know Bill McDermott uh, had mentioned that last night uh, from um, ServiceNow and, and yeah, there was a big reaction uh, to it around that. So I think I think we're all just trying to figure out what the heck is this going to look like in the next six months. So let's sure. push on that because that's interesting. Bill McDermott, who obviously is one of the great SaaS, he and Mark Benioff are two of the great SaaS veterans. He said FX and currency effects are going to hit everybody and, and serves now plummeted 12%. But hold on. I, I've been doing this a little while. I don't remember anyone canceling their Salesforce licenses because of currency fluctuations. Okay. So what's, and would you change your marketing budget? Like these macro effects, like we, we like if, if, if they're not going to change renewals and they're not going to change this, how, how do they really, how are they tactically impacting us? That that's where it's confusing. Right. Well, I, and, and Sarah, I think you jump, jump in the end as well, but I think part of it is your revenue guidance actually may be lower because you're, you're getting less revenue from those, you know, other regions. And, yes. and so then that's, it's like, well, if our revenue is going to be lower, um, then our, then our costs better be lower as well. Right. So I think there's, they're, they're trying to figure out some of those trade-offs of how we recognize revenue and the FX, you know, exchange impacts as part of that. Well, I guess yeah. are you, are we lowering marketing 
the, I think sale, the average SaaS company gets like 40% of its revenue outside the US, right? If you, I think Salesforce is probably roughly that. Are you ratcheting down your marketing budgets because mm -hmm. of inflation and currency? Or is that happening or should we people just thinking about doing that? So what we're doing here at Salesforce is really just looking at our customer demand and for all of our product lines. So FX is definitely a headwind. And in our last earnings call, you heard Mark and Brett um, be very transparent uh, with, with you know, the headwinds that um, the FX causes. And it's something which is, it's just bananas crazy how between the yen to the, to the, to the euro, to the pound, and it's, <laughs> the charts are crazy and wonky. Um, but from a marketing standpoint, uh, we are we are just really focused on the future. I mean, whether it's cookieless future, first party data strategy, you know, focus on conversions. Um, that's that's got to be the focus. And you may see some fluctuations in budget, but um, that's the strategy that we're heads down on. And uh, Chris, you mentioned a little bit, and Sarah did too. Um, it's not even just like a journey that goes from here to here. It's a it's a complete omni-channel experience that you can insert yourself into multiple ways. And um, in some ways, it's harder now post-pandemic because during the pandemic, I mean, it was it was all digital. You know, you could focus, right? Now you have to bridge the digital and the physical and do it in a way that feels like you're talking to the same person the whole time. And so that's where at the underpinning of it, it really is your data. And that's where, so focusing on getting your CDP in order, getting your data house in order, understanding the journey so that you can go out into the omni-channel world. And whether it's N NFTs, metaverse, multiverse, who knows, like, who knows what the channel is going to be. But um, we're just staying laser focused on building that incredible customer experience. And that's what drives loyalty and engagement. Is there something material you're doing different today that's interesting in 2022 because of that change, this post-COVID change? Is there something some, something material that's interesting you're doing differently? Um, well, well, one thing we did do is we want, we launched Salesforce Plus, which is our um, online you know streaming yep. service and transforming ourselves from being a moment in time, tactical, um, event-oriented marketing team to being a trusted business media channel that has incredible storytelling uh, with massive reach and a trusted brand. So if anything, you're shifting from tactics to more brand strategy. And that is a huge, it, it's a swing because brand investments are often hard to harder to quantify. People say, okay, how does that you know advertisement equivocate to the pipeline? Um, sorry, I'm doing a lot with my hands. I feel like I'm doing a dance here. So. No, it's a great, <laughs> let's, it's a great topic to talk about how to measure brand, right? It's one of the most fascinating topics in marketing, at the, especially at the CMO level, right? But that's yeah. where you're seeing the shift is like, you're, is like you need to get your data house in order so that you have automated journeys and engagement. And that's not even just your marketing campaigns. It's tying into the conversation and having a you know, an automated conversation on your site. And this is where Salesforce has an incredible ecosystem of partners. Um, and in, in empowering, you know, all of the omni-channel experiences, whether it's, you know, over text, whether it's um, in the metaverse, no matter where it is, but it's it's very important um, that you are, are omni-channel and that your brand is is one that people trust because people are, they're buying more of their heartstrings than they are their purse strings in terms of, I want to invest in a brand that stands for these values. Yeah, and so is, is the, is Salesforce, is that ratio tweak, like of your budget, has has is is it a material tweak more to brand in in this in 2022? Um, I would say yes. I mean, we've made some big investments with brand. Like we had, we went, we did Super Bowls, we did Olympics, we're doing Formula One. Uh, we're going to places where Over the one's I, the classic one, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, it's been amazing. It's been it, what's yeah. it, what's incredible is that we're we're not just bringing in, um, and this is important from a brand strategy. Don't just slap a logo on it. I told them that's not what I want. Um, I want to power the fan experience. So every um, you know, Formula One fan, they are experiencing what it is to have a one-to-one -one customer journey because it's powered by Salesforce. And also, um, I have to say, I'm very proud of this, helping Formula One to become a net zero sport by 2030. Um, and simple things like they're changing the order of their events 
because it's a lower carbon footprint to travel like sequentially around the world instead of bopping all around different places. And yeah. those are very simple things that um, we're helping them do. And so it's, it's, these are the type of brand investments. It's like, how can your technology show up in the brand investment that you're making? And Sarah Varney, you're doing it again as CMO. So how, what are you thinking about? I'm glad for punishment, Jason. What's that? I'm glad for punishment. <laughs> that, that could be a whole different session. The, the second time or third time, CMO, why are they doing it again? <laughs> and what are they no longer willing to do? Right, right. <laughs> how, what's, your, what's your learning now about brand as, a, as, a, as an up and coming leader? Like how are you thinking about budgeting? where to do it, how to tie it together like Sarah Franklin. I'd love to talk about what we learned from Salesforce TV. If we had more time, we might run out. But how are you thinking about that topic today? Yeah, I mean, I've kind of separate, separated out as two questions. I think there's a question about brand and how it evolves over time when you're, uh, you know, a, a business in the hundred millions of revenue to, you know, billions and billions like Salesforce. And then I think the second is like, how is our shift changing this year? Yeah. Um, you know, brand wise, I think, you know, we just ran our first ever brand campaign this um, last quarter. We were really excited about it. I love the space that we're in. I really, truly think that we're changing the game for, for B2C marketers. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that but we were a relatively unknown brand. And so I for the the, the first kind of iteration of that, I thought it was just important to establish who we are. Like we do we drive sales with SMS marketing and not get too fancy and try to be, um, you know, too advanced in in how we're going to change the world. But I think yep. that, you know, over time as you evolve and so that's a tactical tagline, very tactical, very practical. I always say to my team, not, not, we, not yeah. we make the world better or not, not flowing leaves and, and rivers, just exactly what we do. Very prescriptive, right? Well, yeah. I mean, I think there's a time and place for the flowing leaves too. So don't yeah, get no, Cisco's good at it. I get it. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, just very practical. I always say to my team, Hey, if someone's driving down the one one at 60 miles yeah. an hour and they see your billboard, are they going to remember what it says? And so you, you know, it's, you can, I always look at billboards and say like, oh my God, I can tell like seven people had to approve this because it's got like, you know, four different taglines and a picture and a whatever. And I think it's just like very simple, straightforward copy. But you can, you know, over time your brand, there's an expectation that your brand stands for more than that. And I think that, you know, companies like Salesforce are a perfect example of, of, of how a brand can really evolve to be, um, you know, a platform for change. There you go, Sarah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that, um, you know, that just evolves over time as, as, um, you become a bigger company and, and, uh, and touch different types of customers. So but just to, just for us to learn. So th it's your first big brand campaign. Are, are you tying it back to the funnel to conversions? How, are you measuring it in a way and, and how much of your budget and how do you figure out how much to put into it? Yeah. I mean, I, um, I don't know that you're ever going to have a scientific model, obviously on, on brand awareness. It's going to spit yeah. out like four years down the road, how this affected your funnel. And so I try to yep. think in like heuristics. And I think that like, I roughly say like, all right, you know, 70% of your budget should go to programs that you know are going to drive demand and that are like bird in the hand tactics. You know, 20% should go to awareness, like kind of trusted awareness um, channels. And then 10% can be total experimental. That's just like, kind of like the rough mm -hmm. um, breakdown I, I have in my head when I approach it. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, I think it's very tempting in this environment to take your foot off the gas when it comes to brand. I think that's absolutely well, that is right. When there's a, even a hint of tumult, you're like, Oh, I'll cut the the soft stuff. Right. I, right. I can't stuff demand gen, but I'll cut that soft stuff. Right. Right. And I yeah. just think it's a long game. And I think you have to always kind of keep that fire burning. And if you don't, you're going to wake up one morning and your you know, competition is going to be in your backyard. Yeah, we had, uh, we had an, an op what's that? Go ahead. Chris. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think, I mean, that's an important lesson to have that conversation with the CFO and, and that partnership too, because that it is the easiest thing there, you know, when there's, when marketing has the most discretionary budget, um, they're, they're going to come to you and say, Hey, we need your help here. And you have to have that conversation and that relationship and, and the trust uh, of your leadership team that says, if we do this, the ramifications may not be in the next few weeks, but growth next year and beyond and thinking the long game and marketing, not just like this quarter and next. Yeah. Yeah. Let's come back to that. Cause it's so, you know, when, when, when we had this stock market, I don't think we have a SaaS downturn, but we have a stock market downturn. I don't think any of us are disagreeing about that. Right. Every, and, and we had Sequoia earlier. So everyone on Twitter is like cut marketing is like the first thing, right? Cut, cut marketing. Like, um, and, um, I, your point about it being the most discretionary is interesting, but when you cut marketing, you cut the medium term, right? You don't cut the short term, like unless you're truly like hyper transactional mm -hmm. B2C, but you're cutting your medium term off. So I don't know what the answer is, 
But cutting marketing can't, can't really be the right answer, can it? No, I mean, all of us are going to say no. <laughs> well, I know I'm speaking to the choir, but I yeah, guess no, 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 no. point is, how, how, do you, how do you argue the other point more in a better way than me saying you're cutting off your medium term? Because that is what's happening. You're cutting off your, your pipeline in a year or maybe even two years in some case, if it's a big deal, right? Maybe, maybe a, a nine-figure deal at Salesforce may take a couple of years to, to close on occasion, right? Yeah, but you're cutting it off. You're cutting your, your, your medium term off. The conversations that we're having is um, – and this is what I talk about with Mark and Brett is saying, um, let's not talk about how we cut. Let's talk about how we be more efficient. And, yeah. and so um, if anything, I feel invested in more. And this is why getting back down to something I said earlier, which is it all comes back down to the data, not just the data that you have about your customers, but your data house in, has to be in order um, inside of like your budgeting, your effectiveness, all of that. And I love Varney, how she's talking about, um, you know, keep it simple. Like the, the same way that you would talk to your customers, talk to your internal stakeholders that way to build that narrative. Um, because because cutting marketing is very short term thinking and that's what's going to cut your future growth. And all of us will be on the chopping block when, you know, you're like, oh, where's the pipeline? Where's the growth? And you say, well, if, if you're not investing in the growth, but the, the conversation to have is not what cuts we're going to make. It's how are we going to make ourselves more efficient? Yeah. Is sales usually a top ally of marketing in those discussions? Do they, do they see the value of those medium term pieces or, um, or, 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 or uh, which, which side are they on, on the CFO, uh, <laughs> the, the, the cut versus keep side? Do they understand well, the trade off or they think it's not? Yeah. What's that? Oh, I was going to say, I, I think you need to bring them along for the journey. They're going to be yeah. a big ally for you um, in those conversations. And I think like, you know, sometimes you're not going to be able to piece it together in like, a, you know, a big spreadsheet and look through like all your deals for the last three years. Sometimes what's even more powerful is going through the anatomy of like your top five customers and all the marketing touch points along the way, like map those out for like some of your, the customers that you always talk about at your events or the customers that come up at QBRs and be like, hey guys, like, look, the, you know, it wasn't just about like a cold outreach there. They went to these three events and then they went to this exec dinner and then when they went, you know, to this, you know, other thing and whatever, and like really map that out to say, like, look at all these touches that, and, and then you, you map the deal, the, the size of that customer along that journey. And yep. like, you know, unless you're doing something totally wrong, normally uh, through the course of those kind of three to five deal um, reviews, uh, I think you can absolutely build a great case for your salesperson that, that that they see your part and their part in that. And it's not like, oh, marketing did this all and or sales did this all. It's very much a like, hey, we did this together and we should do more of it. And the yeah. magic comes when, you know, it's not just multi-touch attribution, but the magic comes when you can um, analyze it to have a formula. You can say, you know what works best? When we do two events, a follow-up meeting, and get this person to webinar, and this is the formula. And the more that you can come to your distribution and sales teams and say, this is the formula that's going to give us um, the best um, uh, win rate um, or the biggest deal size or the you know, largest account penetration or the biggest growth. Um, that's when, and, and that's what every CMO you should be doing is like make yourself strategic inside your business. Um, in Salesforce, I've been super proud that the role of CMO sits on our ELT, direct report to the CEO. And um, it was very important that the team also feels like we are strategic. We are important to the business. And you're really the glue between your product, between your distribution, between um, all of your you know, back office G&A. And you embrace that role. You know, you embrace being that strategic person. And another thing is also being very transparent. I feel like I've earned a lot of trust internally by, you know, I don't hide the budget. I don't hide it. I've used um, Tableau to create our heart of marketing, which is just shared transparently. And it's, that's been a game changer uh, and being accountable. Hey, that didn't work so well, but this one worked pretty well. And that's how you earn the trust of your stakeholders, whether it's sales or product or finance or, or your CEO. Yep. Can we just because um, it, it, we, we, we I wish we had like an extra hour, uh, genuinely speaking, but the theme of our day is about conversions, I think, in part. Right. And um, I think there's a 
there's a basic element which I mean it is crazy I think when a lot of us started in B2B we really we, we, we really just thought a lead was a lead right just just drive leads get names get sign up stick them in then we figured out marketing automation stick them in a, in a system and um, and conversion was one of these B2C th things that we sort of understood but like we didn't spend a lot of time with bigger budgets right but what is what is state of the art in 2022 are there are there changes you're making to improve it to improve because we're you know Every, everyone we can get to learn about Salesforce, a 10 of our box, we've got to do everything humanly possible to close them, right? Not let them go if they're potential buyers. So what's, what is state of the art or what's changed in 2022 for your thinking? Yeah, I think um, I'll jump in. So I, th I think Jason, like we've got two different segments we're trying when we think about conversion. One is our e-commerce business. So, you know, obviously that's when they get there, we got to do a good job of creating a, a customer experience where they do convert. Um, and yep. then conversion at an enterprise level. And so, you know, I think in the past, marketing often high-fived when it like passed over a lead or an MQL and we said, great, good luck, go close that. Yeah. Um, and we optimize a lot of our metrics around how many of those we could actually go build. But in reality, that doesn't matter unless it turns into revenue. And so this goes back to Sarah's point where you have to have your data house in order and be able to tie all of the, after, all the events, all the activities, all the channels back to a closed deal. So you can say, here's how I'm optimizing around revenue, not just around sort of pipeline and opportunities. So I think that's that's critically important in this day, whether it's a CDP or basically your data house, you gotta, you gotta actually have that that entire workflow or end-to-end -end -end flow uh, from an analytics perspective. And Chris, at Box, is, how many employees at Box today at a billion in ARR? Uh, we're just over 2,000 employees. 2, and so 100, you have, how big is your data team or how many folks does it take to manage this data warehouse and all of this? Like how big a, how big a team of analysts and P triple PhDs do you need figuring all this stuff out? I mean, it's amazing. They can scale again. We're big Tableau customers, right? You can scale. We're, we're yeah. segment customers. And I think technology is helping us scale in a, in a bigger way. We do have... I would argue one of the best data analytics teams on the planet, which is yeah. I'm very, very lucky. And I've got a handful of dedicated to the marketing organization that helps us answer all of these questions, but it's not hundreds. But can 10 folks do this for you? Like, yeah, even, yeah. I mean, a world-class job in 2022 totally. for Box. How big a team do you need to, 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 to get, to have a world-class, um, yeah, we probably have sub, customers. sub 10 ish, like super smart people, and uh, to help us drive a lot of that it doesn't have to be an army. Um, technology yeah. is definitely helping us do this in a much more scalable way. Yeah. Yeah. What are I mean, you changing, I'll, Sarah? Tara Varney? Um, well, I'll, I'll talk about I'll talk about how we're coaching our customers on this, and then I, mm. uh, BDC perspective, and then I'll talk about B2B. We've got both sides. Yeah, on the on the B2C side, I think this year we've seen a shift from uh, first party data to actual zero party data. So not just observing like what someone's doing, but actually more the intent behind it and uh, selfish, uh, you know, shameless plug. But like we do think that SMS marketing is a great way to do that through quizzes or surveys just to get more intent about how often someone wants to be contacted, the types of products they're interested in so that you can serve back up very personalized, relevant product recommendations. So you know, that's, we're definitely seeing that on the B2C side. Um, on the B2B side, we're definitely, I think all of us, I think all of us on the call, whether um, you're at, you know, Salesforce or Attentive, you are, we're all being asked as marketers to do more with less. Um, and, you know, we are really focused on conversion. I am, we are a customer at full uh, transparency. We are a customer at Mutiny. And we've definitely, um, you know, given we have a, a small development team and using Mutiny, we've been able to do some rapid testing on, uh, our you know web pages from paid ads. We've also been able to do spin up a lot of work around ABM and, and targeted account um, content that we wanted without a huge staff of developers. And so you know that's been uh, really effective for us in terms of um, you know helping to drive conversion and, and get the most out of uh, the people that are the leads that are coming to our site. Yeah. And are you? How do you think about conversion as a metric? Is it an absolute metric per segment that you're trying to drive up during the course of the year, or how do you how do you think about it? Is it is it a, is it a is it a sort of a core KPI? I, I mean, absolutely. I, I don't um, you know, similar to what Chris said, I don't want to take a victory lap for like, uh, you know, growth of MQLs at over 100 percent when our our, um, you know, SQLs are not matching that growth. Um, so we really take a look at the, the funnel holistically and then beyond it, uh, to Chris's point, it's not just about getting the deal signed, but, you know, we're very much a pay as you go model or user usage based model. And so. 
Um, we can't just leave it at the signed deal. We work really closely with our customer success team to make sure that we're um, enabling our people on the core uh, features and core best practices or use cases that we know are going to drive retention and usage long term too. Got it. Um, pretty interesting. Um, we'll uh, we'll probably. It looks like we've got about four more minutes. Um, uh, tell me, anybody, tell me if I'm wrong. We've we've got about fifty questions that we won't get to. Um, but maybe I'll I'll try to get in just maybe one or two more things. Um, a, a version of question I already asked, but. Anyone got a, a learning from this year of something new they brought into their marketing team, something new they brought into their department, something new they're doing that moved the needle, like something in 2022 that moved the needle or, or that you're very passionate about as a CMO, one of the two? Um, I'll just start. I already said Salesforce Plus is something that we did. But um, the other thing is we've this isn't necessarily new, but we've been going huge on in person. Um, and what it means to have in-person matched with digital. And yeah. we've been bringing in the expertise, like instead of hiring um, new copywriters, I'm hiring like script writers and people with broadcast experience. That's mm. it's, and it's not just about being you know, digital in a Zoom. It's about really thinking like, and apologies for this, analogy because I live in the Bay Area and I love the Warriors and we won this year. I was very excited for the basketball team. Um, but understanding that, you know, you can experience it something like a basketball game by going to a live event or sitting on your couch and watching, getting a special event or going to like a bar or restaurant, enjoying it with friends. And you have to operate in that world. And, um, and I'd say, so bringing in that. And then the other thing is that, everyone needs to operate like B2C. Like you can be a B2B company, but that's something that we've brought in is like, okay, we are a B2B company, but we're going to act like we're B2C. And you have to set up B2C scale, B2C infrastructure, B2C personalization, B2C data, focus on things like conversion, Jason, like you were saying. Um, and think like, okay, our SDR horse, you know, we want to make that, you know, have as much as much of that being technology driven uh, more so than people driven so those are some of the things we're bringing to the marketing it's like bringing even more tech in and thinking b2c got it and and being back in person being together it sounds the whole the whole yes. field playbook is working again right it's it's more cultural than it is anything it's um it's very interesting how cultural um connection is very important with just connecting with your customers yep Anything? I know yeah. we've just got two more minutes. Anything, Chris or Sarah Varney, you're doing to connect more with your customers in 2022 in this post, post-ish post COVID world? Not really post-COVID, but post-ish COVID Yeah, world. I think, I mean, a couple of things. One, conversational AI has been pretty interesting for us as we've helped you like it? And, and drive that. Yeah. Um, so that, that's been great. And, and unlike Sarah, we have not done a lot of in-person. We just did our first event in London um, about a month ago. And we're looking at how do, what's, what does that balance look like in hybrid? Right. And where do you optimize? And you have to optimize both for the digital audience and the in-person. And it's almost like two different events in one that you've got to think through. And, and that's a new yep. muscle for us. And right? not do so both, again, both mediocre. <laughs> yeah. So that's it's it's an area that I'm, I'm like excited about trying to figure out and learn from. But uh, yeah, it sounds like there's a couple ahead of us. <laughs> yeah. I'll just, I mean, first off, I just want to give kudos to Sarah Frank. We worked together for a number of years and she was doing hybrid events before they were cool. So this is like her Super Bowl right now. We did it together, girl. We did it together. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, Sarah was made for this era. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I don't have much else to add beyond um, what was said already. I do think something that's, um, that's changed massively to our advantage now that remote work is, I think, generally here to stay in some, you know, form or fashion, like, it's just opened the talent pool tremendously of who we can, you know, hire and um, and the types of talent we can recruit as marketers. I probably would not have even been in the, uh, you know, running for the job I have now. It's a we're a New York based company, and my whole family is ah. in San Francisco. And so, you know, I think that that is um, something that is is changing the game for all of us as marketers. And and we're not just recruiting from the same pool in San Francisco if you worked at Salesforce for ten years. You know, your 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 apertures open right up and i just think that that's gonna change the face of, of b2b marketing in a lot of different ways well look i'd love to even dig into that because it's, it's such an interesting topic but we are out of time we had about 100 questions from the audience sorry we didn't get to them maybe we'll try to do some later if we can but let me thank the panel i think this was a great pulse check um and 
uh, a great chance to learn from, from the best. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah, Sarah, and Chris. This was amazing. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Jason.